Welcome to the Unmasked Podcast, where we unmask compromisers, cowards, and wolves, showing what biblical Christianity is not, so that you will better understand what it is. I'm your host, Tyler Long, and I'm joined by my co-host, Joey DeRunce. Uh, We come to you from Clark County, Washington. We're a ministry of Masters Bible Church, and uh, we're doing this podcast because of the decay and the problems that we see in the church in our community. And so I was born and raised here. Um, grew up in the church, um, so to speak, for lack of a better term, church, um, and was saved despite that um, a- approximately four years ago. And the Lord has opened my eyes and given me a heart for this community. And it pains me to see um, the compromise and the cowardice on the part of uh, so called Christian leaders in this community. Joe, you want to introduce yourself? Well, like you said, my name is Joey Durantz. I'm the pastor at Master's Bible Church. I went to the Master's Seminary and came up here as part of a Grace Advance church plant and came up, we visited, my wife and I, and we we just fell in love with the people here. And so the Lord's been gracious to us to allow us to to labor uh, and to, um, to advance the gospel in this area, an area that has a church almost on every corner, but doesn't really have a biblical church on every corner, just the name church. Yeah, exactly. And so that's one of the things that uh, we aim to do in this podcast is to um, uh, peel away the decades of, of compromise that have been ingrained in the minds of Christians. And the reason that this is um, such a problem is because the, the shepherds aren't training the people uh, in their congregation to what the Word of God says, right? If they, if they did, people would spot these problems. And so our goal in this podcast is to um, honestly, methodically, and fairly um, go through the Word of God and, and really open people's eyes that are in, in these churches to what the Word of God says uh, and sort of, you know, get the defibrillator on them, so to speak, and shock them back <laughs> into uh, sobriety and sober thinking on, on these matters, right? Because um, we get Amen. tied into our traditions uh, way more than the actual doctrine of the Bible. Wouldn't you say? Yeah, absolutely. So the opportunities are endless um, for how we could illustrate this and the problems in the local church. Um, and we're going to have many opportunities, but most of the um, examples that we're going to use are going to be from local churches from the Clark County, Southwest Washington, and Portland metro area. And so, since COVID's a big thing and um, is really exposing uh, a fear of man and a, and a cowardice and compromising on the part of, of leaders, um, this is the perfect opportunity to use uh, one church's policy and how they've communicated that to... Um, discuss what the biblical view of the church is. So, our first example that we're going to use today is from uh, New Heights Church, and the pastor is David Whiting, and he had this little message about three weeks ago um, explaining their philosophy going into uh, the new mandates from Governor Inslee. Hi, New Heights Church. As you likely know, Governor Inslee announced new guidelines this week, and if you've read the list, you know there are some implications for our worship experiences. And for the next four weeks, we've been asked to have no congregational singing, to limit music from the front, and everyone on stage to be in masks. So we're going to make another pivot. And here's the good news. We're still going to meet. Operating within those guidelines, we'll continue gathering with a reduced schedule and with modified worship. You can get all the details on our modified schedule at newheights.org slash COVID. But I do want to mention a few things. First, our Thursday night services are on pause. We're going to use Thursday nights to record for the online services on Sunday. Secondly, services at North, East, and Main will be one service on Sunday morning at 9.30. INA will have a service at 1.30. We're expecting this pivot to carry us through the end of the year, but we'll be evaluating as we go and adding in services if our attendance requires it. 
Okay, so that's the first third of his video. And hopefully if you're in the audience, you can spot the problems with this. Um, first and foremost, what's, what's the pivots they said they were going to make? No congregational singing? I can get into the mass on stage, but let's just go for the low-hanging fruit. No congregational singing. Is that a reasonable um, thing for a church to not uh, adhere to? Singing? Not, adhering to the governor's mandates, but not adhering to the normal uh, forms of worship, which is singing. Well, I think that really depends on where you get your information from. So... Why do we even do church? Like, what, what are we doing with church? Where, where, do we have a rule book? Do we have a playbook? Is it based on feelings? Is it based on culture? Is it based on experience? Is it uh, geographical? And all of those things, in some way, you could say yes, if you said, yeah, all of those things that were recorded in Holy Scripture. All the experiences and everything with the divine commentary that we have in Holy Scripture. So we have to always say, what does the Bible say? Exactly. What does the Bible say? And what does the Bible say about singing? Dozens upon dozens upon dozens of times, we, we are called to sing to the Lord, or to make a joyful noise to the Lord. Even the, the commands that we see prescribed in Scripture, in, in um, Colossians 3, in Ephesians 5, we, we are to sing. We are to let the word of Christ richly dwell in us. And I have those uh, verses up, and I think yeah, it would be helpful for our audience them. if we just read them. Um, so Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Um, Ephesians 5.18-19 through 19, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Um, James 5.13, just to put a good bookend on this, says, Is anyone suffering among you? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Do any of these sound like a suggestion to you? No. If they're a suggestion, then so is loving your neighbor. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. The, these are commands. The, uh, the it's epistles. Just take scissors to the Bible. Exactly. The epistles were written for instruction in godly living. Okay? This is how you Christians are to carry out the faith and to live in this way. And to let a, a Caesar, just to put it into biblical terms, because that's uh, what Inslee is, to, uh, the modern equivalent of, to let Caesar dictate. How you're going to approach God is completely unbiblical. And so, how did we end up here? That's the question. How did we end up where uh, thousands of people can sit in these churches and not see the problem with this? Well, I think, you know, as we were talking, I think it was yesterday, the other day we were just talking about fear of man going on in churches. How, how long has that been going on? I mean, you, you see it really come to light with like purpose driven church. And things mm -hmm. like that, because with purpose-driven church and other things, what, what you're doing is you're turning the church into a business. And when you start turning the church into a business, I mean, a good, a, a good quality to have in your business is you need to know your customers, you need to know what your customers want, what are their needs, what are their felt needs, what are things that you can convince them that they need. Right. Those are great business practices when you're trying <clears throat> to sell something. But the church is not a business, the church isn't trying to sell something. The church is supposed to, is the pillar and support of the truth. So it's not moved around by the culture. It's supposed to hold fast to what the Word of God says. I mean, think about it. You know, this happened, um, there's the big movement um, some years ago, and you had the stickers, N-O-T-W, not of this world, right? Yep. And, and that was, a, oh, I'm not of this world. No, I'm, I'm, I'm an alien, but I'm not like a, a foreign alien, like, spaceship. We are strangers and aliens here. We are not of this world, and we're supposed to act like it too. Which means there's going to be certain things that are going to come our way that we have to say, I can't do that. Whether it's legal or illegal, that's irrelevant. There's certain things that come our way because everything is held to the standard that God gives us in His Word where we say, I can't do that. Maybe it's, you know, uh, you think homosexual marriage is legal. But we go, I can't, I can't participate in that. 
in, right. in any way. Singing right now is illegal. But you say, I can't abide by that. I must sing. I have a reason to sing. And what did the apostles say in Acts 5 when they were uh, dragged before the Sanhedrin? Right? We must obey God. God. We obey God rather than men. And if church is not the realm of God, what is? What is? If God has not you know, earned our devotion in the realm of worship, has he de- earned our devotion and obedience anywhere? Well, if, if we as the church aren't holding fast to this, who's going to do it? If, we're not, if, if we, the people of God, who mm-hmm. have been redeemed by Christ, aren't holding fast to his word... Who do, who do we expect is, is going to do that? Mm-hmm. Is the world going to step up and, and hold fast to the word? Is the world going to be the pillar and support of the truth? No. It, there's, there's, I, I'm, I'm struggling to find any kind, of, any kind of way whatsoever in which following this guideline from the governor where the church does not sing, how is that not sin? Because what, what is sin? Um, you take you know, the catechism I do with my kids. Any thought, word, or deed that breaks God's law either by commission or by omission. Commission is doing what God forbids. Omission is not being or doing what God requires. Right. God requires that we sing. And we should be excited about singing. And you know, it's a pandemic though. It's a pandemic. And Christians should fear a death because for them death is a sad thing, right? Yeah. Because there's nothing after this. Heaven forbid that we would have to die and be present with the Lord Jesus Christ. What's heaven? Is that <laughs> such a place? <laughs> <laughs> well, heaven, a true Christian knows, is coming face to face with Jesus Christ. It's Amen. not the you know golden streets and uh, you know pearly gates that is what attracts you. It's the fact that you're going to be with Christ. Okay? Amen. And it doesn't mean that you know you go rock climbing without a harness. But it also means that you don't cripple yourself with fear over a virus with a 0.1% death rate. That is a completely worldly point of view and way of thinking. That you're going to uh, forsake the gathering together, which is commanded in Scripture, and you're actually, you're gonna, even when you do come together in a token manner, in a limited capacity, you're going to forsake the singing over this virus because Caesar said so. What does that reveal about your view of God? Well, I'll, I'll one-up you on this. Let, let's say that there, that there was a 100% death rate. Yeah. Let's say that it's guaranteed. Which life bar- has, by the way. Yeah. Not to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I can tell you the statistic that everyone that drinks water dies. That's right. So water causes death. <laughs> no, but let, let's, barring some, you know, divine intervention, uh, apart from God's normal use of secondary causation and providence, let's say that you had faced a situation with 100% of death, 100% chance of death. Is it okay to not obey the Lord in those times? No. And you know what? God's given us divine commentary on that. He's given us a divine situation recorded in Holy Scripture for us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There you go. They would not bow down. They would not bow down, which meant what? Certain death. And they even said, Oh, King Nebuchadnezzar, we, you know, we're not going to obey you in this because our God whom we serve will save us. But even if he doesn't, Amen. We're still not going to bow down and worship this thing that you've set up. Well, that's a picture of faith. And so a shepherd whose primary goal, as the Bible says, as one who will give an account, should be instilling that into his flock, that God will deliver us if we honor him. But even if he does not, even if he does not. We're still going to be delivered, ultimately. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So even if he doesn't deliver us now, you know, that's one thing that it's, it's, it's so sad to see so many Christians afraid of being with Christ. Afraid, afraid of stepping into his presence. I, you know, I get some of that. In my flesh, as a father, as a husband, leaving my family, you know. But can God take care of my family? Mm-hmm. Can he do a better job than I can? Absolutely. Can he do it without me? Right. He could. I'm just thankful that at this time, he's ordained that, that he thinks the best thing for my family right now is for me to be here. But he doesn't need me. Yeah. And, and Paul even says in Philippians, 
it's better for me to depart and be with Christ. Yeah. Why are so many Christians afraid of that? Afraid of seeing their Savior? Yep. No, I, it's saturating the church. This, this, it's because they're not grounded in the Word of God, because the Word of God is not being preached from the pulpit. You have you know, some verses, one or two, up on the screen, but it's not being taught exegetically. It's not being taught uh, holistically in terms of the whole counsel of God so that we can take every captive obedient to Christ and you can start to develop these worldviews. There's nothing that you will encounter in life that the Bible hasn't spoke to uh, either directly or implicitly, right? Right. And so there's nothing that we can encounter as a church where the pastor, if he's being faithful, shouldn't be able to shepherd boldly and fearlessly. And so before we get too far along, I think it's important to understand that there's two uh, presuppositions that need to be granted. It, number one is that... Uh, God's on the throne, no one else, and that he has ordained how we approach him, right? Yeah. Um, and number two is that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of God, and it is authoritative in all manners of life. Amen. You, defy, you deny either one of those, well, you're not even a Christian. So we're just going to grant that those are assumed among you, and if those aren't assumed among you, you need to repent and turn to Jesus Christ. Because you're not a Christian. So, mm -hmm. we will base our critique based uh, on those two fundamental truths of the faith. So, if you have that in your framework, then the critiques will make more sense. That the Bible has told us how to live. And it is authoritative. If you think it's a suggestion, you're not a Christian. Right? The scripture is inerrant. It is inspired. It's been given to us by God. It's, and because it's been given to what, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is, mm -hmm. some translations say inspired, literally God breathed. Mm -hmm. Just like your words are Tyler breathed, my words are Joey breathed, which <laughs> carry with it all of our intrinsic authority, which is nothing, right? Yeah. Because we're nobodies. Uh, we're just a couple nobodies making this podcast, hoping that we can persuade you to obey the one whose word is authoritative that every single person, Christian and non-Christian, will be held accountable to. Mm -hmm. And it's sufficient for all manners pertaining to life and godliness. You know, I, too many people that profess to be Christians, too many of them, I'll, I'll put it this way, even though on the face of it they probably wouldn't agree, but functionally I think, they, I think it fits. They're looking for a vacancy in the Trinity. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Looking for a vacancy in the Trinity that they can fill because they're saying, hey, y'all taking applications because I think I'm a pretty good fit. Here, look what I've done with my church. Have you, have you paid for those people's sins in that church? Mm. I, yeah. I get, I'm a pastor, but, but I'm an under-shepherd. Yeah. Jesus Christ is the only senior pastor. He's the only chief shepherd. I'm just an under-shepherd. And my task is to faithfully shepherd his people according to his word because he knows his sheep. His sheep know his voice. And so what do I do? I go back to the word day in and day out. When I teach, I teach the word. When I make decisions, I do my best to do it according to the word because that is our rule. That's why it's called our canon of scripture. It's our rule. It's, yep. our, it's our measuring rod. Absolutely. And so it's established here that to bow the knee to Caesar in this regard is sinful. And it's rooted in a fear of man. Um, and so we look back, we read the Bible, um, you know, we see the Apostle Paul preaching the gospel, getting beat within an inch of his life, drug out of the city, recovers, walks back in the city. That's the type of fearless faith that we're to emulate. Now, that's a pretty high standard, but the Apostle Paul himself said, imitate me as I imitate Christ, right? And so if we cower as a church at the threat of what, a fine? I mean, really? The apostles were getting stoned, you know, and crucified. The outcome doesn't belong to us. Right. And yeah. we're, we're scared of a fine. This is the state of the Christian church today. And, and, and that's where we're at. So, um, there's, this video obviously goes on. And so, um, unless you had any thoughts on this first well, section. Yeah, really quick. You know, yeah. thinking, because some people might not say, I'm not scared of a fine. I'm, I wanted to just, you know, I wanted to be kind to my neighbor because this thing kills. 
it reminded me a couple years ago when I first moved up here, there was that, that kid, I think he was even from this area, I'm not sure, that went to that island off the coast of India somewhere he yeah. was going to bring them the gospel. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know who this kid is. Or I think it was he, the Centalese. Or, yeah, if he was really going to bring the true gospel. But I remember so many professing Christians were up in arms. Mm -hmm. How dare he? He's going he's gonna to give them the flu and they're going to die. And again, it goes back to just what you're saying. It, what are our presuppositions? And you have to think, let's, let's just think about this. It's so simple. Would you rather live to be 110 years old and die outside of Christ? Or would you rather die at 21 years old in Christ? Well, it's not even close. Um, because if you're not uh, a child of God born again, um, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, then every year that you live is just accumulating a greater debt, sin debt before God. So it, it's it's far more worse the longer you live. Yes. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, now we should preserve life as a principle, obviously. But we're just talking, you know, you know, from an eternal perspective. You know, if you have the mindset that, you know, death is the worst thing, physical death is the worst thing. No, that's the wrong perspective. Physical death is not the worst thing. You know, spiritual death is the worst thing. Right? Jesus Christ said, do not fear him who kills the body. Fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. Yeah, and that's not Satan. That's not Satan, no. That's God. Yeah, he's saying, fear me. Yeah. Not Inslee, fear me. Amen. Good, so section number two here of this video. Now that you know where we're headed, I want to take a minute and share some of the thoughts and give some insight into the approach our leadership team has taken through this season. Let me start by addressing the virus itself. The rise of cases in our county is real and it's significant. I know many of you are experiencing this personally and if there's any way our church family can help care for your family, we want to know. Just yesterday, there were 277 new cases, a new daily record for Clark County, and that's not the kind of record you want to break. Since Friday, there have been almost 600 new cases of COVID-19 in our county, and cases have increased 50% in the last month. The Clark County Public Health has given up their practice of contact tracing, and instead, they're interviewing people to identify locations where exposures may have occurred. And we'd rather not make that list. Okay, so what's the natural human response to being called out for their sin? Excuse, excuse, excuse. We tend to defend it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you catch your child, at, uh, you know, with his hand in the cookie jar, and what does he do? He blames it on his sister. Uh, he blames it on the fact that he has, hasn't eaten today, right? What do we, we have it built into our own lexicon excuses for sin. I woke up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. My parents have a, a video of me when I was little. They, we were making cookies, and they set up a camera and then walked away into the other room and were watching it. Right. And um, they said, Joe, are you eating the cookie dough? And I went, shaking my head with a mouthful of cookie dough. Yeah. Yeah, we, we always deny our sin. That's the problem that we have is, is we love our sin. But we need, to, we need to love God. We need to love Christ. That's why the first commandment before even loving your neighbor is loving God. And yes. so that means that we're going to have an eye toward what is sin from a biblical worldview, and we're going to hate sin because we love God. We can't really love our neighbor until we not love ourselves. We already do that. Mm -hmm. That's part of sin. So we love God. Yeah. And when you're sinning, you don't want to stand alone because that is a light shine upon your sin whenever you're sinning alone. And so that's what's happening here, uh, folks who are listening to this, is he's sinning by not faithfully shepherding his flock, by not seeing as God is ordained. It's rooted in a sinful fear of man. And so what's he going to do? He spends an, almost an entire minute justifying his sin by getting you on board with the justification. Fear, fear, fear. Disgusting. And love. That's wrong. What God has commanded is a command. This is how you are to approach him. And if singing, which is a commandment in Scripture, is optional, then there is no command in Scripture that is no longer optional. Who gets to decide what is optional and when it's optional? God alone. Yeah, so that's a great thing that we need to remember. Whenever you're working with Scripture, you need to recognize Scripture is universally applicable. The only exceptions are the exceptions that Scripture gives. 
Yep. And so you think, um, is it okay? Th think about it. What other sins are okay during a pandemic? Can I can I commit adultery during a pan? It's a pandemic. Well, fornication because they're not performing marriages down at the courthouse anymore. Yeah. So so is is that okay? Hey, you know, weddings are banned. So you know what? Um, I'll just say a prayer for you over Zoom, and, and you all can be married. And go go ahead and uh, you're married in God's eyes. No, this is ridiculous. So, so think about it. It must be universally applicable, except with the exceptions that Scripture gives. And you know what? This this kind of thing isn't new. Luther had the plague. Uh, right. Spurgeon had the cholera outbreak. And while you take precautions, you, you don't just blindly submit to the government. You never blindly submit to any authority. And most of you that are listening to this and watching this would agree that if, if your pastor told you to do something that you didn't think was right, you wouldn't say, well, I have to obey. Or if a parent said something to the effect of, uh, you know, we're, we're, I'm going to have to prostitute my family out so that we can make this month's rent, you'd say that's not appropriate. So who gets to say, you know, we're going to prostitute out the church. We're going to prostitute out God's people in a sense by calling them to do something that they're not supposed to do and by calling them to not do something that they are supposed to do. Yeah. And, you know, you touched on the doctrine of lesser magistrates, which is something that we're going to get into in a future podcast. But it's something that everyone knows intuitively and adheres to. They just don't know it. And they, and, so they, and they try to put artificial limits on it. So nobody in the audience, I would imagine, has a problem with the Nuremberg trials and the fact that lower-ranking officers were still tried with, for war crimes. They were obeying orders. Yeah, that doesn't fly. No, we prosecuted them and put many men to death for obeying orders. So, and nobody has a problem with that, nor should you have a problem with that, because they have a duty to disobey. And what greater law is there to obey than the eternal law of God and how we worship and approach Him. Amen. Nothing. Nothing. Disobedience in this uh, instance is not excusable under in any way, shape, or form. And so not only do you have an ignorance of uh, the Bible and what it teaches, which is why people just blindly go along with it, but you also have a complete ignorance of Christian history. You don't know how the faith has been lived out through faithful men. This is not a unique situation. In fact, on the grand scale of pandemics, this is the least. Okay, In Jesus' time, you had leprosy. Did they forsake meeting? I'd rather have COVID than leprosy. Well, here, here's something we have to think about. Did Jesus ever go to lepers? He did. And so are, are you prepared to say that Jesus didn't love his neighbor? Because not only did he go to neighbors, yeah. but then after that, he went to other people too. And mm -hmm. so what if he would have contracted leprosy? But without knowing it in his humanity, and then walked over to somebody else and touched them and passed that leprosy off to somebody. No. They, well, again, we're not saying go out and lick doorknobs, but we're saying, no, and if we you have symptoms, here. stay home. But that's the case every year. If you had the flu, you were staying home from church five years ago. Yeah. Like, and that's even biblical. Uh, going back to uh, the Old Testament and the, and the laws. When someone had a skin disease or other illness, they were quarantined. Mosaic not well. the well. Like, not the, not the healthy, I mean, yeah. in terms of well. They weren't quarantined. They, they didn't have restrictions uh, based upon the danger of what that other person had. And, you know, that's a good point. The, the whole of, um, let's say, Israel, they didn't stop their sacrifices. They didn't stop gathering because some people had leprosy. Nope. nope. Everything, everything went, went along. Day of Atonement wasn't stopped because 10 people outside the camp had leprosy. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, if you insert this situation into any example in the Bible or any example throughout church history, you would just laugh at the lack of faith. Yeah. And history would not view those people kindly. At least Christian history, secular history maybe. Christianity has been illegal for so long. Uh, it's, it's just only until recently that, it, that it's really you know, been able to be legal and be practiced. I, I recognize under Constantine, and, but it was perverted. And shortly after it's perverted, then you have the Roman Catholic Church coming along and, and saying, hey, it, this is heresy, this is heresy, all things which, which Scripture prescribed that you needed to do. But think about this. Even the Puritans, when, when Christianity was 
supposedly legal, but biblical Christianity was illegal, they would flee. Uh, you, can, you can read through church history and find even... Um, they would disobey because they recognized the gathering together was so important. They would meet at tri-county lines so that if one magistrate from one county came and tried to arrest them for practicing biblical Christianity, they could flee to another county where he had no jurisdiction. Yeah. And so they said, you know what, we're going to have to be creative. They didn't blindly obey. They didn't blindly submit. John Bunyan. Most people, I think most people would never do what John Bunyan did. John Bunyan was imprisoned for preaching the gospel, and they said, as soon as you stop preaching the gospel, when you say, I will not preach the gospel, we'll let you out of here. I think most people would say, well, you know, I gotta, um, if I don't provide for my family, I'm, I'm worse than an unbeliever, and so God will understand. I mean, I, I've got, you know, seven kids, one of them's blind, and I've, I've really got to really help out and, and, and work for my family, so God will understand. He said, as soon as you let me out of here, I'm preaching about my Savior. Yes. You're not going to stop me. Exactly, and we see that um, with John Rogers, uh, you know, was marched to the stake with, uh, to be burned at the stake with Bloody Mary watching, and that he, he was holding the ground for um, what we would call a secondary doctrine, an important doctrine, but um, a secondary doctrine, meaning it, salvation doesn't ride on it, um, which is transubstantiation, that uh, the blood and the wine become the literal blood uh, and body of Jesus Christ. And he was willing to burn to death and said, what I have said, I will seal with my own blood. And he marched in front of his whole family to burn at the stake over that secondary truth because there's no such thing as an unimportant truth if it's a truth of God. Yeah, you right? think about... We say secondary only in terms of salvation, yeah. not unimportant. We were talking about this. Just think, just the, the shift in... Um, in the Galatians, in the Judaizers' worldview, in their, their form of Christianity, it had the same components. It was just a different order. Mm -hmm. are, are you justified and then you obey the law, or do you obey the law and then you're justified? Right. Which way does that work? And Paul, Paul pronounced an anathema twice upon them for holding that. That's so harsh. Yeah. He said, you're, you're <laughs> damned. Exactly, and then, he, and then he said, "If circumcision is so important to you, why don't you just why don't you just cut it all the way off, and then you'll really be spiritual, then you'll really be holy." Mm -hmm. it, such we're too such afraid course, of that. Such uh, direct talk is is so unloving. Yeah, yeah. No, in, Elijah. In, <laughs> exactly. Um, but to to sum up this, you know, uh, section, and we'll get to the last uh, segment of his video uh, shortly. But he also reveals within this video that he doesn't actually believe what he's saying. Because he says part of it's love for your neighbor, right? Okay. If love for your neighbor justifies this changing and modification, this pivot, as he put it, in your worship, why didn't you modify two weeks ago when cases were spiking? You didn't. You waited until Caesar told you what to do. And then you modified. So does that mean that a week before Caesar told you how to worship God, you were unloving? Because you, you didn't ban congregational speaking, you didn't have mass uh, with, on the people that are up on stage, because he did root it in love, and love for neighbor. Okay, so love for neighbor, actually, based on uh, his own statements, isn't really the modified worship, it's the bowing to Caesar. That's what is implicit in how he presented it, is that the love for your neighbor is bowing to Caesar. If we think about one of the best passages that we have on loving your neighbor um, comes from the lips of our Lord. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Right? When the guy, and when he says, and who is my neighbor? And he tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. N notice, notice what you have in the Good Samaritan. Yeah, the guy goes out of his way to help someone out, to help someone that, that's beaten. He doesn't avoid them. He goes to them personally and takes care of them personally. So, it's, he never is told, you know what, deny your faith, compromise on some aspects of your faith. All, all, those, all those aspects where the Good Samaritan, as we call him, sacrifices himself, don't pertain to denying any aspect of doctrine. He's saying, I'm going to go out of my way 
and use my own personal means because I recognize that everything I have comes from the Lord. Loving your neighbor can't be described, too often it's defined by the state. Yep. And churches have adopted this, hey, this is how you can love your neighbor. Or somebody like the Gospel Coalition, or some, yeah. you know, largely apostate group like that. Yeah. Well, and, they, and, and that's crept into the church, the definition of love. We no longer have a biblical definition of love. There's nothing more loving, well, look at me, nothing more loving that you can do in this world than to call someone out uh, for their sin and call them to repentance. Yeah. Because their soul, eternal soul, rests on it. That's what's at stake. It's not loving to let people march headlong into hell with no warning. It's not loving to show your lack of reverence for God by kowtowing to every dictate from Caesar. I mean, are you really showing a deep abiding affection for your Savior Jesus Christ when a non-believer, a God-hater, can tell you to zig and you zig, tell you to zag and you zag? In your worship of Him. Well, let me ask this, because I think, I think this is going to be helpful. If you call yourself a Christian, when was the last time you proclaimed the gospel to somebody? When was the last time you went to somebody and told them about the virgin birth, about the perfect life, that God came down from heaven and took on human flesh, and that He lived the life that, that we could not live, free from sin, and that He died for sin, and that he was raised on the third day having defeated sin and death, and, and that unless you repent and call upon the name of this one, Jesus Christ, you will be saved. When was the last time you've actually gone out and done that with somebody? When was the last time, uh, how many people could you say, recognizing in God's sovereignty, how many people have been saved through your ministry, through yours, father, mother, brother, sister, only child, whoever you are, whoever you might be. See, that's why this is so hard for people to grasp. Mm -hmm. Because what will they not do? They will not go out and preach the gospel. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll give money to missionaries, which is a good thing, and we need to be giving money to missionaries so that they can do that. But it doesn't preclude us from no, doing that same work not. here. And because people don't understand what a mercy ministry is, where you're going and you're giving tangible things along with the gospel, yep. then it's so easy to come along and say, oh, you need to love your neighbor. And this is how you're going to love your neighbor. No, but you're right. The way you love your neighbor is by bringing them the gospel. doesn't mean that you only bring them the gospel. You can bring them a sandwich. You can bring them water. Absolutely. You can bring them a roof over their head. But the gospel, if it's not present, is not a mercy ministry. It's a ministry of the devil, and it's meant to lead people to hell. Amen. Amen. And, and that offends people's sensibilities, but that's because your mind is not conformed to obedience to Christ. And um, we're, it's not an option, it's a command to go and therefore make disciples. And so, Joey asked you all those questions. The only one that you could fail in that is how many people have been converted, because that's up to God, not you. But if you can't answer that you've shared the gospel with people, um, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, called men to repentance. Um, if, if you've never done that, um, and I mean the full gospel, <laughs> the demands of the law, the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, and the call to repentance. Not yeah. Jesus loves you and has a wonderful plan. No, for life. exactly. That I was going to say, we're not talking evangelism. about that. That's not evangelism. No, not you don't at even all. know if that's true. No. It just sharing the name it depends on or the word perspective. Jesus with another person is yeah. not sharing the gospel. So if you've never shared the gospel what with someone. What if you share it as Yeshua? Yes. Oh, yeah. Then, <laughs> sorry. But if you haven't done that, you're not a Christian. I'm sorry, you're not a Christian. Um, it doesn't mean that you've shared that perfectly. It doesn't mean that um, you know, there's a, a certain quota that you have to meet. But if your heart, when you're born again, the first thing that God changes is your desires. And your desire is for Him. And your desire is to be obedient to Him. Obedience Amen. is the natural um, outworking of faith. And so, when he commands you to do something, you want to please him. Amen. So, then there's this uh, last section, which uh, we will get into. I wish I could tell you it gets better, but it doesn't. Now, the governor's guidelines are temporary. They've been put in place to help slow the spread of the virus, and we want to be good neighbors, and we want to love our community well. And if reducing the number of our gatherings and modifying the content of those gatherings can communicate our love for our community, we're happy to do that for a period of time. 
I know that all of us have opinions and thoughts about COVID-19, government overreach, civil disobedience, and where the line is to be drawn. We don't think this four-week request is unreasonable, so we'll follow it for now. Thanks for your prayers. Thanks for elevating your desire to love and reach our community over your own personal preferences. And thanks for being willing to be flexible as we attempt to navigate this unique time. Let me leave you with this thought. God is up to something. And he has chosen us to be alive at this time and this place to be part of what he wants to do in the lives of our families, our neighbors, our co-workers, our friends, and our county. May he do the work he wants to do through us. Okay. It's just four weeks, man. It is. Well, that's the first thing, is he comes out and says it's temporary. And so, you know what? Most sin is temporary until you sin again. Um, and so... We, it's we already have... been extended by this time, though. <laughs> it's, yeah, as, that's what's so silly. As if we were meeting all year. Yeah. Right? It's as if we've weeks. been meeting since March in full um, a- attendance... No mass, full singing, no restrictions, and then all of a sudden a temporary thing comes down. Um, like when, when COVID was Still first discovered in March. In theory, not even in theory. In, in reality, a church could shut down at its own judgment, though, not bowing the knee to Caesar. Its own judgment that this is dangerous. Like if the church building's on fire, obviously, you know. <laughs> Yeah. You're not going to go in because, well, the Lord commanded us to sing. Yeah, he yeah. did, but guess what? You can sing tomorrow. And you think about, I mean, yeah. we're, we're not all you know, scientists, and so while this thing is being figured out, we wait for the data to come out. You right. don't have to be a scientist to be able to critically read and process information. Right. If, if a scientist has gone through and said, hey, I've done these studies, here's the information, mm-hmm. here's, here's what it says. Yeah, and that's, that's what a lot of churches did is said, let's wait and let's see what happens because obviously if this thing is going to kill... You know, hundreds of millions of people. We we don't want to be we don't want to be responsible for killing hundreds of millions of people. And if there's a way that we can prevent it, then, then we'll want to do that so that we can continue to advance the gospel. Uh, maybe we need to have gloves. Maybe that's the thing that we have to have. If you have rubber gloves on and you go and you walk around, you can prevent it. But that's that's not the case with this. And the, and the the fatality isn't there. I mean, you just take the same precautions you would with the flu. And so you know, if I have the flu. I'm, I'm not going to be going and, and hugging somebody. When I have the flu, I'm going to say, hey, you know what? I know I'm going to hug you in a week. I'm going to wait till that week's over, and then mm-hmm. I'm going to hug you. Right, right. And so we do have data now. We didn't in the beginning. So in the beginning, a church could make a prudent decision, similar to the fire analogy, that, you know what, we're going to wait. Because the, uh, the first information coming out was... Uh, you know, a couple million dead, this or that. Well, guess what? We have data now. And there's uh, the last release... Um, I saw year to date 127 deaths in Clark County. 127. Now, that doesn't mean that those lives don't matter, but it's not a justified excuse for changing how we worship a holy God. It's Absolutely. just not. No. No. And, and, and even the, the measures that are being taken aren't contributing in any way towards less death. You're not, you're, you're not saving lives by staying at home and wearing a mask. You're just not. That's not true. There's nothing to support that unless you watch CNN. There's nothing to support that. But what you are doing is you're compromising your testimony. Absolutely, you're compromising your testimony. You're showing that you have the same fear of death as a pagan. Yeah. Right? And Hebrews uh, talks about those who, who fear death and become a slave to that Hebrews fear. Hebrews too. Yep. Um, so that, that's a mindset of a pagan, is, is that, so you, your testimony is weakened, and, and this is how great my God is, that uh, I'm not going to sing to him on Sunday. Wow, what a transformed life you live. What a testimony, that we can boldly interact with the world with mass, and not singing, and reduced uh, schedule, and you know what, you can sit six feet apart and only in family groups. This is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Um, and it doesn't mean that there's not room within the church for those who are overcome with fear. You can and should be, be loving um, to your brother who, you know, maybe has more fear. But you shouldn't give them a false testimony. Like when somebody's delusional and schizophrenic and think they're hearing voices, it's not the loving thing to do to tell them, yeah, you know what? 
listen to those voices. That, you know, it's a good thing. But you that's know, a good no. That's a good illustration because th think about this. What we're seeing right now, biblically defined, is irrational fear. Irrational. Irrational fear. And so you think of you know Ephesians four, Colossians three, and other places. What what is the principle that we have? We have put off and put on. Put off sin, put off selfishness, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the big picture. And so your smaller ones, uh, you see uh, put off lying, put on speaking the truth, put off stealing, put off working with your hands, put off irrational fear and put on a sound mind. And the only way you're going to get that is from the Scripture. And you're going to get that from Scripture at church and with fellow Christians as you're speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, as you're letting the Word of Christ richly dwell within you, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. And so, you know, if it's temporary, even if it said, you know what, let's take two Sundays and uh, you're not allowed to sing anymore, it, you still have to sing. You have to sing. You still get to sing. There's still reason to sing because Christ is still victorious. And Amen. so we, we should... We, we are the people that sing. All other religions that sing are just copying. They're, they're usually just, they're just cults trying to copy. Because God has prescribed singing. God has created this and He's prescribed it for a variety of reasons. Maybe we can go into on a different date. But nevertheless, it doesn't matter if you're given a prescription from Scripture and then a prescription from a magistrate that says, this you need to stop doing, or this you need to start doing, that goes against Scripture. Whether it's temporary or not, irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Think, think about Daniel. It's 30 days, don't pray. Yep, it was a temporary order. Temporary. And, and they what, didn't even say you had to uh, forego your religion. Just for this month, you got to bow to me only. And it, Correct me if I'm wrong, but in there, it didn't say that you had to bow even. It just said you can bow to no one else. In those yeah. 30 days, right? So, and it's temporary. Well, he, I can hold on to my religion. Windows open. He didn't have to have his windows open. Nope. It's like Calvin said, though, you know, when, when sinning is popular, praying, or when uh, sinning, when praying is popular, uh, praying private, when it's not praying public. Exactly. Whatever's going to exalt the Lord. Yeah. Whatever's saying, you know, I'm not, what I'm not going to do is I'm not doing this for the praise of man. I'm doing this for the Lord. Whether I need to stand boldly, or if standing boldly seems to be the fashionable thing right then, if, if standing out, then you know what, I'm going to make sure doing it privately, because ultimately I have an audience of one. It's, it's for the Lord Jesus Christ. It's for my God. That's why I do what I do. That's why I live what I live. By His grace and for His glory. And Daniel... The interesting thing about Daniel, when you look at Daniel chapter 6, yeah. you see Daniel chapter 6, you see they couldn't get him according to his law. If you have your Bible, just look at that really quick, because I think yep. I think it's, it's so instructive. Daniel 6. Verse 5. I'll just, we'll just run through this, and you can read it at a later time. I encourage you to do so. These men said, We will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. What are they saying? They're saying, This guy always obeys Scripture. He always obeys. He, he's a blameless person. You ever thought about that? Have you ever seen a blameless person? Somebody that, that doesn't outwardly sin? Have you ever seen that? Somebody that doesn't, doesn't mean that they don't have sin in their heart, but... They, there's no infractions, there's no trespassing because they love the Lord so much that they do everything they can to make sure they don't misstep. And there's definitely not going to be an intentional misstep with them. So they've conquered sin to the extent that it's not outwardly visible to anyone else. Yeah, by God's grace. Yeah, so, by God's grace. Yeah. So they're not running around doing all, all this stuff. And they're, they, when they do sin, it's, it's because they're, either it was an accident, they weren't focusing, but not because they weren't trying, not because they weren't engaging in the battle against sin. So they saw this with Daniel, and they said, you know what? We know how to get him. Let's take the state, let's take Caesar's law, so to speak, and let's place it above the law of God. Because then that way, when he keeps this law, he's going to fail in this one, and then we've got him. And so that's what they did. And they established a statute, enforced an injunction, verse 7, and it couldn't be changed, verse 8, according to the laws of the Median persons. Now look at verse 10. When Daniel knew that the document was signed, 
He entered his house. Now in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem, like Solomon had talked about. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had done previously. The law comes out and says, Daniel, no singing. And Daniel says, I was singing before this came out. Scripture says I'm supposed to sing, so I'm going to keep singing. And the example would be, as soon as the edict came down not to sing, he went out on his balcony and was singing. Yeah. I mean, that's what he did. He opened up his windows, was praying openly. Guys, we're going to have an emergency church service. For all to see. We're going to have an emergency hymn sing. Exactly. Right now. Let's have a psalm sing and a hymn sing right now and a spiritual song sing. That would be the far more appropriate response to the governor's dictate not to sing. Would be to come to church on a Friday night when you normally don't meet or Thursday night, whatever, and have a singing only service. To remind the world and anyone in that congregation who has any doubts who it is we serve Amen. and who it is we please. Look at verse 22. But didn't Dan, did Daniel sin by not obeying the government? Look at verse 22. Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den. God preserves him. And he says this, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him and also toward you, O king. I have committed no crime. So there's a difference between sin and crime. Crime is the jurisdiction of the state. Sin is anything, any thought, word, or deed that breaks God's law, either by commission or omission. And so what's going on here? How can he say that he committed no crime when we know that he committed a crime? Yep. Because the state did not have that authority. You look at Romans 13. There is no authority except from God. God is the ultimate authority, and every other authority is delegated. The state doesn't just get to do what it wants. Pastors don't just get to do what they want. Fathers don't just get to do what they want. You don't get to just do what you want. All of us must submit to the authority of God. And so, when the scripture says we must sing, that we are blessed and privileged to sing, and the state comes out and says you can't sing, well, we're going to sing. Yeah, and you have dozens of psalms that are written for the choir director. I mean, this is a core element of worship. It's abundantly clear in Scripture. Um, so the temporary thing is no excuse. For those of you um, doubting that, you need to go to Daniel uh, you can, uh, 6, starting 5, all the way up to 13, or you can go past that and see that he faced um, being thrown into the lion's den. Far worse than a fine, and far worse than, you know, making a list from the health department. Yeah, or you um, could look at Daniel chapter 3, and you could say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I mean, how temporary is bowing down one time? Yeah. Absolutely. Ten and minutes. God forgives. Yeah. God, God will forgive them. And we should sin so that grace will abound. Yeah. That's what Paul said, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, Something like that. That's not what he said. <laughs> he did not say that. No. Um, he did not. So, uh, another aspect of his, this, this last section is he said there's varying opinions, preferences, and whatnot. <laughs> okay, Pastor. Do varying opinions and preferences matter? If nope. you're running a business. If you're running a business. If you're running a church and your job is pastor and to shepherd the flock, there's one opinion that matters, and that's God's. And your job as pastor is to make sure that your flock knows what God's opinion is on this matter and that they know if they're outside of that opinion, they're in sin. Yeah, we need, we need to instruct, and we also need to lead the way by example. Right. So I need to study the Scripture, apply the Scripture to my life, and then teach it to others. And lead the way in that. And so when, when they said, uh, when the government said, you're not going to sing, you know, somebody, you know, you get, it gets sent to me. Hey, we're, they, the governor said we're not going to sing. I was like, oh, what are we going to do? We're going to do just what we've been doing before. We're going to keep singing. Because I don't worship Governor Inslee. I do my best to respect him in all areas to where he has authority. But in the areas where he does not have authority and he tries to reach out and exercise authority, that's tyranny. Yep. He's not allowed to do that. And I recognize because Scripture says he's not allowed to do that. So it doesn't mean that I'm going to call him names. But you know what? I, I have a higher authority that I serve. Even, even, why, why does uh, Peter talk about if you suffer for doing what is right? How can you suffer for doing what is right? It's if very you, easy. If you always follow what the government says. Mm -hmm. If you always follow what the government says, then you'll never suffer for doing what is right. Mm -hmm. That's yep. not going to happen. 
Well, and we see this, um, it's idolatry. If you put anything above God, that's idolatry. And we, and we see that it's pervasive in his mindset. Number one, um, he gives credence to these quote-unquote varying opinions. Um, well, I know you all have varying opinions. Pastor, who okay. conform their mind to Christ. Irrelevant. In obedience. Yeah. yeah, we don't care about your opinions. Does God have an opinion? Right. Then that's the only one that matters. And that's his job, yeah. is to say that. He could have said, I know you all have very opinions, and none of them matter. Because <laughs> here's God's opinion. <laughs> that would have been the, the only way to bring up varying opinions on yeah. the matter. Um, and you also see it in terms of him saying, um, you know, we're going to obey these restrictions for now. He, he's a agreeing in there that there is a point when disobedience is warranted. Yeah, he, he, it's he implicit talks about in that the line. statement. Yeah. He mentioned the line. And, and he was like, you know, we all have different opinions, even on where that line is. Well, I know where that line is. And, and, and he knows where that line <laughs> he is. He knows where that line and is. And if he doesn't know where that line is, then he needs to step down. Any pastor that doesn't know where that line is needs to step down. Because the line is it's Scripture. Yep. It's, that's why it's called the canon of Scripture. It's, it's our rule. It's our authority for all of our life. All things pertaining to life and godliness. What's outside of life and godliness? Death only. Death only. <laughs> and then absent with the body is present with the Lord, right? Yeah. That's right. And so you see that idolatry in his statement, though, in that he thinks that him or even the leadership at New Heights Church um, have the authority to slide that line. Like, we're going to obey. For now. Okay, so you're the authority then, Pastor. You're the authority. And you've already instilled this in your congregation by saying you all have varying opinions. And you've affirmed that. So you've affirmed it in them. You're affirming in yourself that we're a law unto ourselves. Yeah. And we will decide when it's crossed the line. Not when uh, we violated the direct commandments of Scripture. That's not the line. No, it's, it's idolatry. I've, I've heard um, even... You know, some, some local churches around here, you can read their statements on their website or, or hear their, their updates too. We've met together as elders and we've prayed about this and, um, and we're not going to sing. What? Who, who are you praying to? Because if you're, if you're praying to the God of the Bible, it's not like, I, you know, I, I need to figure out what God's will is for my life. Your sanctification, First Thessalonians tells us. We go back to Scripture. So I don't get to say um, to my wife uh, or to anybody else, like, hey, you know what, I've really prayed about it, and, and I'm going to leave my wife and leave my family. I, I, don't, I don't get to say, just because I said I've prayed about it, that doesn't make it more sanctified. That doesn't make it more no. holy. In fact, it makes it more blasphemous. It makes it more blasphemous. And, and, it, and it shows the, the disqualification of an individual or individuals to say, I've prayed about this, but, and then taking a different course than what Scripture says. Because if Scripture says, this is what you need to do, of course we should be praying. Lord, give me strength to carry this out in this difficult time. Yeah. Because I, I want to be pleasing to you, my audience of one, more than anything else. Think about, think about what Christ went through on earth for His own. And that if we're not like our Master... We have no part with him. Exactly right. Everyone knows John 3.16, that God's loved the world. Yeah. And they forget to read a little further in John 3.36. Yeah, they do. And, they, and then what about even, um, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're to emulate Christ. He was obedient to the point of death. To the point of death, people. And we're to be obedient to the point of death. In fact, if you're not willing to lose your life for Christ... Because that's in Scripture as well, in Luke. If you don't pay your own life more than me, you cannot be my disciple. When he says you cannot be, he, says, he means you're not. You're not my disciple. Not able to be. Yes. How about that? Yeah. May I use the restroom? No, you may not. Are you able to? Yes, you're able to use the restroom. You're not able to be his disciple. Nope. If, no, you're not. And so we need to conform our minds to this. And so when, when, you, when you know what the, the Word of God teaches, how authoritative it is, and how clear it is. The Bible's not unclear, guys. The Bible's abundantly clear on these matters. Uh, the problem is, is that we've been saturated and inundated with worldly messages. And it's been in the church for decades. I know because I was in these churches for decades, and I didn't know any better until the Lord saved me, and I really started diving into the Word of God. And I'm like, this is powerful. This is clear. This is different than what I've been taught. Um, and so, finally, where him and I, um, and you as well, would probably agree with him, 
is that he said God is up to something. And so on that point, we have agreement. Um, but we're going to basically end the agreement there because what he's up to uh, is something entirely different than, than what he thinks. I'll tell you what I think God's up to. And then, Joey, you can uh, add on to that or, or you know, give your thoughts on the matter. So I'll tell you what God's up to. He's revealing who the faithful are and who the faithful are not. That's what he's doing. Okay, He's purifying his church right now. And so you have genuine sheep in these watered-down churches. They may not be great in number, but they're there. And he's showing them the lack of faithfulness on the part of their leaders. And he's going to call them out. And in short order, these unfaithful churches are going to be full-on apostate. Full-on apostate churches without a believer among them. And I can't say what that timeline is. It could be a year. It could be five years. It could be ten years. I don't know. It could be happening right now. It could be happening right now. Um, we don't know. Because a genuine believer in Jesus Christ obeys and yearns for fellowship with Christ. And God has given us, that's why we're called the body of Christ, the church. That's what the church is. That's one of the tests of salvation in 1 John. Yeah. yeah. Is a love for the brethren. Yeah. Right? And so to be separated from your brothers and sisters in Christ is akin to being separated from your child. Right? And you've used that example before. Yeah. And love, love isn't just like, I have some sappy feeling. It, it, it's, yes, there's a feeling there, but it produces an yeah. action. So it's not like, oh, well, I, I do love God's people, but I don't spend any time with them. No. Think, think about if God did that. Think about, for God so loved the world. And that's it. <laughs> that He didn't give His only Son. No, He did. Because there is the love, and it produces an action. And love is defined in Scripture. And so we follow after God's love. God's love, and yes, there's a sense in which it's a feeling. I know that God's immutable and God's impassable. Uh, it's one of those mysteries that sometimes it's difficult for us to understand, but He always is love, because God is love. But it's an action-producing love. If it's yeah. not an action-producing love, then it's not really love. Right, exactly. Love's not... Oh, and that's another way that the world uh, has uh, saturated our minds, is we've confused love with uh, sappy feelings. Yeah. No, it's not. Love is action. Yeah, and again, loving your neighbor doesn't mean... Staying away from them and masking up your face and not talking to them. It means engaging with them, talking with them, contending for the faith, contending for Christ, recognizing that whoever they are, they've been created by God to worship God and to bow the knee and to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're a sinner in need of a Savior. And if you're a Christian... How much do you have to hate somebody not to tell them the only thing that could save them, the good news of the gospel? Yeah. Yeah, fear not COVID, but fear him who can cast both body and soul into hell. Yeah. That, that would be the loving message to give them. Um, it doesn't mean you can't uh, you know, use tact to a certain degree, but um, without watering down the message, uh, one iota. Yeah, I think so, Ezekiel 34, um, you know, to what you were talking about, about shutting down churches and things, um, this, this idea of spiritual abuse is, is nothing new, unfortunately. It does take all different shapes and sizes, um, but at the heart of it, it's abuse because it's saying, I'm not going to listen to what the Lord God has said. In Ezekiel 34, it says, Then the word of Yahweh came to me, Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to those shepherds, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, Woe! Shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat sheep without feeding the flock. Those who are sickly you have not strengthened. The diseased you have not healed. The broken you have not bound up. The scattered you have not brought back, nor have you sought for the lost. But with force and severity you have dominated them. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd, and they became food for every beast of the field, and they were scattered. It sounds kind of like what's going on today. The sheep are scattered. The disease, they're diseased. They're broken. What do we need? 
right now, more, more than anything, what the church needs right now is, is we need Christ. We need to know who we are in Christ. We need to know what the Bible says. Because, yes, these are trying times. These are challenging times. And, and yeah, you know what? I, I hear even with, with what he's saying there, I hear a lot of the fear being slung. All, all, all these increases in numbers. All these increase in numbers. Every disease is going to increase in numbers. The deaths aren't going up. Because and, and, they never reset the death clock like they do uh, the flu every year. They're just running it every year. It's ne- they're never going to stop the death count. And even though the flu's yeah. counted with a calendar year. And then they start the count back again at zero. They're not going to do that with COVID because they're instilling fear. Yeah. Not to interrupt. That's, no. <laughs> well, what, what, what do the people of God need right now? When, when the government, when the world around us is propagating fear, mm-hmm. we, need, we need to, like, like we've been saying, fear not. Fear not, I am with me, and be not dismayed, for you are with me, and will always give me aid to take it and modify it a little for bit. For he did not give us a spirit of fear. Right? No, he did not. Um, and so, and you, we, we've talked about this many times, and but people may not know this, but cowardice is repeatedly in Scripture painted as something inconsistent with salvation. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, you're pulling up the verse. Yeah, if you have your Bible, turn to Revelation. And turn to Revelation 21. And then look at verse 7. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly. Cowardly. And unbelieving, and abominable, and murderers, coward, murderer, and immoral yeah. persons, and yep. sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. There's two sad realities when we take this and we apply to what's going on right now. There are people that profess to be Christians that are cowards, yeah, and they're not going out and propagating their faith because they're hiding. Well, you know, I, I could die. So we're. We're meant to die. Romans chapter 8. We are like sheep to be slaughtered. Our job is, is to die and to die well. Because Christ died and died well for us. That's our job. That's our responsibility. The second category of people is those that are unbelievers that are cowards. Here's the thing. If you're a professing believer and you're acting cowardly, there's a slim chance that you're saved. But there's a larger chance that, that you're not. So I would encourage you, so turn to repent and turn to Christ before it's too late. Repent and turn to Christ before it's too late. Because there are those that are out there that are cowardly, that do not know Christ, that at least have a reason to be cowardly because they have no hope. And it's our job to bring them hope, and the hope that only comes in the gospel, in the person, in the person of Jesus Christ. He came in the flesh, not so that we could hide in our little bunkers, but so that we would go out person to person and proclaim this glorious gospel. Amen. Amen. And so for those of you at home, our, our hope is to uh, encourage the believers. Uh, if, if you a believer that's doubting and you're in one of these churches that um, is teaching these things that are basically nothing more than uh, bowing a knee to Caesar, rooted in cowardice and a fear of man, that you would be emboldened. Um, to step out in faith, know that you are not alone, that God has given you other uh, believers to strengthen you and to come alongside you, and we're meant to do this walk of faith together. We also hope that if you're in this church and all of this sounds strange to you, that you would, with an open heart, search the scriptures. Search every single scriptural reference that we gave you and know that it's true. Know that this is what the Bible says. And ask yourself, do I not like what they're saying because I don't think that's what the Bible says? Or do I not like what they're saying because it grates against my flesh? The truth always grates against your flesh. Always. Okay, the Bible paints a clear picture between, distinction between walking in the Spirit and walking in the flesh. And so, if, if the reason that you don't like what we're saying is because you don't think that's what the Bible says, that's easily cured. Open your Bible, and we've given you lots of scriptural references. You will very quickly be conformed to the truth. If the latter is true, you are in grave spiritual danger, and 
your soul could uh, end up in an eternal uh, state that you don't want to end up in, in torment, um, at any moment. Your next breath is not guaranteed. And we tell you this in love. Um, we, we, we say these things so that um, the truth would be known um, among the churches in this area and anywhere there where people may be listening. Um, I think of, you know, it makes me think of Matthew 7. Like, assurance is, is a beautiful doctrine, and, and we can have assurance of our salvation. But if we're living in sin, then, then we, shouldn't, we shouldn't have assurance of our salvation while we're living in sin. But that's why you have warning passages, like all throughout Hebrews, there's warning passages. That's why Jesus says, not all those who say to me, Lord, Lord. So many people that call themselves Christians, they don't even call Jesus Lord today. Yeah. But even <clears throat> among those that, that do call him Lord, not all that say Lord, Lord. Well, it says many who say to me. Yeah. Many is no small number. No. And what, what ends up happening? You, you see that there's two roads. And we've talked about this um, in, in the past before, not on this podcast, but even on the wide path, there's narrow paths that look like the real narrow path, but they're still on the wide path. And so we always need to go back to, what does the Scripture say? And one, and one thing that you cannot replicate is the church of Jesus Christ. The way that God, in all of His wisdom, has ordained the church that He would purchase a people and that we would be the instrument to build one another up by coming together, not over Zoom. Zoom is not church. I don't care what anybody's told you. That's a lie. You can't be gathered together. Think about this. If, if you think Zoom is a church and the church is called the body of Christ and we are His hands and feet in the flesh to carry out His work, what would you rather have? Is it appropriate for you to have... To see your arms and your legs over Zoom? Or to have them attached to your body, functioning properly? Yep. We, yep. We, need, we need to be gathering together. We need to be singing praises to the Lord. We need to be worshiping Him. Yeah. And we need to be proclaiming this gospel and making disciples. Because Christ is worthy. Absolutely. And the, the foundation building stones of this um, biblical worldview, Christ-centered worldview, are too numerous to cover in one podcast. But we give you our word that if you come back and you listen to us again, we will be methodically building uh, the case for this biblical worldview. If this wasn't convincing enough, if the Lord has given you an ear to hear, we will go to his word and we will continue to build this. We'll talk about what the church is, why it's um, uh, organized in Scripture, the way it's organized, what its function is supposed to be, what its purpose is. And so that's you know, a very important topic that we didn't get into today because we can't cover uh, quite everything. But uh, we invite you to come back um, to our next podcast. And until next time, there is no king but Christ. There is no king but Christ. And we'll teach on that also as we talk about lesser magistrates, the church, and relationships there. So we look forward to seeing you next time. God bless you. Be lovingly obedient. You need to weigh in on the cost factor and count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. It will cost you popularity. It will cost you promotion perhaps at times. It will cost you an easy life. You will have to discipline yourself. You will have to buffet your body. You will have to say no to temptation. You will have to say no to this world. You will have to break with the crowd. You will have to be willing to stand alone for Christ. You will have to be willing to walk to the beat of a different drummer and to, to step out of the crowd even if no one follows after Jesus Christ. You'd be willing to stand if you're the only person in the world for Jesus Christ. That's the cost factor.